Oh, it's been all go lately, hasn't it? I'm reviewing so many different things. Uh, this isn't the video that you're expecting to see. You're expecting to see a review of the Pip Seymour early watercolours from Cornelison. Well, don't worry, you're still getting it. I had to film a little introduction, and the reason I've had to film this is that when I made the video, which is coming up in a moment, uh, Pip and I hadn't actually spoken at that point. I'd bought the products and I tried to get in contact with him, but due to a technical problem, my email hadn't got through. So anyway, um, also to note now, I'd actually been in touch with Wallace Seymour, which is the company, and Pip Seymour himself specifically. Sorry, things are a tiny bit flickery. I've discovered one of the causes. If I don't focus my camera immediately and make sure the light's really strong, I get this effect when there's a lot of still space. But if I'm moving, it's fine. Anyway, anyway, I'm just saying that so no one bloody rights in because it's getting annoying when people do that when I've stated it in the video. Um, I asked a load of questions which were things that I kind of raised in the video that I've made that I haven't uploaded yet which is coming up in a few seconds. Um, I just wanted to kind of cut in at the beginning and answer some of the things that I mentioned in the video that were a bit odd to me because I don't think um, it necessarily gives you quite the right impression of this product. I wanted to kind of give it a little sort of footnote if you like. Um, Pip told me that the early watercolours line that I said that I could only find on Cornelison's website and I couldn't find anywhere else are an exclusive line only made for Cornelison. Now they are a really really beautiful set of paints and I have only tried a small number of them. I should add at this point that Pip is not paying me to say any of this. Um, I have no sponsorship from Pip Seymour at the moment at all. I'd love to, but we don't have any arrangements. And this is the set that I'm going to be showing you in this video in a moment when you actually get to watch it. And they are really gorgeous, vivid colours. And these are made in a genuine reproduction of an 18th century, so a 1700s um, recipe. So they're very hard and they are made with gum tragacanth and gum senegal and they're really very firm. And when I was doing the video I couldn't get them to wet, some of them wouldn't wet very well and we found out why that is. What Cornelison hadn't told me basically was that when you use this set for the first time you have to wet them with hot water and the first few times apparently you have to use hot water to wet them let it soak in a little bit and then they'll paint normally and once you've used them a few times Pip told me you shouldn't need to do that anymore except maybe on some of the drier earth colours maybe. So I just wanted to kind of get that out so that you knew that. And if you want to order these, you have to get them from Cornelison. They're the only place you can get them. And I think they ship internationally. I will put their details down in the video description and on the accompanying post on my website, which will go into more detail, just so that you've got that information, because I thought it was really important that you did get it. And I just want to use this little moment while I've got you as an opportunity, because in the video that's sort of coming up in a minute you will hear tell of some other Pip Seymour products that I'm looking forward to um, reviewing, namely the Artists Watercolours and the Four Humours set, which is another 18th century set. And they've actually arrived today, so I just thought I would show you how they're different so that you can see it for yourself. Um, the Four Humours set is really a life drawing set, that's the idea of it, and again, these are made to a genuine 18th century recipe. And that's what you get, they're named after the four humours that they thought the human body was composed of back in those days, like yellow bile and black bile and, and all that sort of thing. And they are made by hand and compressed into these discs, and this one is uh, obviously the black one, there you go. And they're compressed by hand and they come in these extremely cute little cardboard um, packages just like that. And I think they're awfully cute. I think these ones have actually been mixed up because the, um, the labels don't match what's in them. Yeah, these have all been mixed up at some point in there transiting across the world so I'll just show them to you terribly briefly just so you can see so this one is Florence red hematite um, which is obviously the red which is incredibly incredibly stunning so that's a natural um, pigment red 101 effectively there is a sati white which um, I did know what that was made of but I've forgotten um, but when I do the proper review obviously I will tell you so there's that one there and these are just used like a normal watercolour, but again, you have to use hot water. 
the first time. This is Vine Black there. And then the last one, this is a natural yellow ochre, which is, um, in this case, made from Provence yellow ochre. So it's a natural pigment red, for, pigment yellow 42, I think. There's actually a hell of a lot there, and it is indeed rock hard. So same kind of base, I believe, as the early watercolour line from Cornelison, or at least very similar. I mean, it even feels very similar. But these are intended to be much like um, the four humours that they used to sort of think the human body was comprised of back in ye olden times. And you'll see Pip Seymour around still, but it's now called Wallace Seymour from the end of last year, I believe. And you can still find them at pipseymour.co.uk. They have so much cool stuff, and they have a new gouache line out now, which is really exciting. You can get that set and the ones I'm about to show you from Turner's in Salford, I think in Greater Manchester in the UK. And again, the details will be down there and on the accompanying post. I'll just give you a kind of little preview of what um, we have to come in terms of the uh, artist's watercolours from Pip Seymour. They all come as a full pan, which is really quite exciting. And when I picked these up, I decided I was going to consciously try and get at least a sort of set of warms, because I like I like warm colours, and I thought I'd get a set of warms, and I would get myself um, just some other exciting colours. So my warm set, uh, my warm primaries are, and these have got the new branding on some of them and not others, so I've got Ultramarine Blue Deep, Cadmium Red Middle, and Cadmium Yellow Middle, and they are all gorgeous single pigment colours. And they are full pans, which are great. They're not actually terribly expensive either. And I'll put the prices down below so that you can see. So you don't have to go digging around in Turner's website just to know what I bought. I got myself a couple of other ultramarines. Namely ultramarine pink and ultramarine red at the bottom. That's actually kind of a purple. It's not quite as purple as ultramarine violet, but it's heading that way. I got myself three greens, um, not necessarily for any real reason. So there's a Bohemian Green Earth at the top. There is a Verona Green Earth in the middle, and if I can get it the right way up, there is a Permanent Green Very Light at the bottom. I just like the vividness of, of that one. And finally, I got myself some sort of more warm earth tones, which in this case were Burnt Sienna, because you can't go anywhere without Burnt Sienna. And... Puzzoli Earth S1, which is a sort of, sort of similar, but it's more, um, I don't know how to describe it. It's more red. It's more sort of like a Venetian red in a way. And uh, Cinebrezze, which is um, a flesh tint, really. So I thought that would give me a really versatile set. And I'm going to put those into this um, Schminker tin, um, although I planned really badly because I forgot that these were full pans. And, of course... You can't get all of them. They're not going to fit. So I think I'm going to have to reserve this Schmincke tin for my vintage early watercolours. And I will get another row of those. Because, you know, I've got a space now. I've got to fill it, haven't I? It, it's a control freak thing. I have to do that. And I will get a larger set, larger box. And I will put these into it. And given I've got a warm triad there, and I've got two purpley kind of colours, and I've got myself three greens here. And I think you can probably see where I'm going with this, can't you? So I've got three, six, nine, ten, eleven. I need a twelfth one, don't I? Because that would be rude. But I need to get one that takes, um, well, it's going to have to take 24 half pans to take 12 full pans. But I might need to get one that will take 48 because I think I want another row of those. But I have to try these out first, don't I? So what I'm going to be doing in a minute while you're watching the rest of this video is I'm going to be filming a new video on these, which will be really, really cool. And that's where I am. So sorry I've had to do this like little nine minute ramble at the beginning. But the purpose of this really was just to let you know that the reason I was struggling with the Pip Seymour ones is just because I wasn't doing it right. It's not that there's a problem with the product. And I trust Pip. I've had a long conversation with him by email. I trust him. Hot water will solve the problem. So don't worry about it. You can still see the full intensity of the colour in the video because 
they put these little hand drawn um let me just focus on that for you so they do these little hand drawn swatches on even the early colors have got these little hand drawn swatches on them which are lovely and so you see it on there even though i don't achieve it in my own test in the video i have no reason to dispute them so what you've got to look forward to are the life drawing set and i will um review those and i've got this set and these are very deliberate to try using for on plein air later in the year when things warm up. Because I've got a set of primaries which you can't go wrong with. I've got the purples and greens for botanicals. And I've got the earths for buildings and sand. And I want to balance that out a bit more and, and expand it. But I'm really curious about these because they have got really, really, really high quality pigments in them. And they are really well made. I mean, that cad yellow is just, it almost looks like it's been printed. It's so intense and so smooth. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you've got these gorgeous, granulating, wonderful, rough-feeling green earths. And the ultramarine is just absolutely to die for. So I want to actually start using these outside. And what I plan that I will probably do in the meanwhile is... Um, you know, as you know, these reviews are moving into a two-part format, which I think I mentioned in a minute, so I won't repeat it. But I will be trying to use the vintage ones to replicate or paint in the style of some paintings from way back. And we'll have a look. And just to kind of plug it that it's coming up, because I've been asked so many times, yes, the Daniel Smith um, Essentials is coming up. Yes, the Daniel Smith Primatex, which is the mineral-based ones, are coming up. And just in today, the Daniel Smith Alvaro Castanier set is coming up as well. So I just wanted to put that out there, that those are, those are coming up, because um, I'd like you to know what's coming on my channel. So thank you for that little 10-minute ramble. And now on with the video. Thank you very, very much. looks like I'm reviewing some Schmincke products, but I'm not. They're just here from my previous review. Um, and I'm actually going to be looking today, and it's my first part of a two-part review, as always. Now I'm doing, like, a first look and some information, and then in a while I'll come back and talk in more detail. This is about a very interesting product that I've known about for quite a while, because I've used acrylics by this company, and they're very interesting acrylics, actually. They've got some really cool colours. Very great texture, lovely pigment load. They're actually a real joy to paint with. And what I love about their acrylics is they come in a tub. So rather than, like kind of like Diane Reevely's Dilutions acrylics, they're in a jar, so you haven't got to bugger about with tubes. And I really like that. Anyway, um, I found out they have, they have watercolours, and unfortunately they're one of those companies where if you go to their website, the information can be a little bit hard to find. And if you dig a little bit deeper and look at stores that are selling their stuff, you find things are sometimes caused, called by confusing names. So I'm going to tell you this information kind of um, as best as I can. And I'm sorry if any of it turns out to be a little bit inaccurate because I'm using the names from the companies I obtained them from because that's the best I can do. Now, as I understand it, this particular company has got several different lines of watercolour. It has got a sort of artist watercolour line that is very, very... got some great, really interesting colours, and I'm going to be reviewing that really soon. I've ordered some, and I'm waiting for them to arrive. So the artist watercolours, which are kind of like the conventional watercolours, if you like, very, very carefully made, very interestingly made. They've got different binders and so on to a standard watercolour, so they sound very interesting. And they also have some 18th century watercolours that mimic what Turner would have used and so on that are made with the same materials Turner would have used and they're very, very different from modern watercolour. I have got some of those on the way as well so that we can look at those. And they've kind of got an in-between which are called the early watercolours. And the early watercolours, um, if you go on their website, you can only see them in tubes. But I found that I could get hold of them in half pans from a company which many of you know, Cornelison in the UK, which are a company of colourmen. And that is to say that they manufacture pigments or they sell pigments. And if you ever get the chance to go to Cornelison's shop in London, it's great fun. So I bought to go with it a Schmincke, um empty 12 half pan or six full pan uh, case because I wanted somewhere to put them because they sell them as loose half pans. This is the same exact same case you get with the um, with the 12 set from Schmincke 
and I just want to just to make the point that's about fifty pounds. These are about twenty, so that values the Schmincke twelve set at about thirty pounds for just the paints. If you look at it as a set of twelve for thirty pounds, these are no more expensive than Windsor and Newton or anybody else. They just charge a lot because they're in a pretty tin. Exact same tin, exact sharp, same issue with the razor sharp edges. I actually cut myself on this. And I've contacted Schmink Schminker to say, should it be that sharp? And they've got another swatch card, which is actually the same one they provide you when they sell you the paint. So it's kind of presumptive that you're going to buy their paints. Um, but it's a nice little tin, and I like it. And I just, I needed one in a hurry, so that's what I got. The company is a bit confusing, because it's just changed names really recently. It used to be Pip Seymour. Pip Seymour has been going for a long time it's run by pip seymour who um, manufactures um, pigments but he also wrote a book a really cool books on watercolor in the 1990s that are really useful they've just changed names to wallace seymour because um pips I, I don't know whether they're partners just in business or partners in life as well but his partner her surname is wallace and they've joined forces so they know wallace seymour but they haven't relabeled all their products yet they're running out the inventory so um it might be a little while before it happens. So I bought six to try them out of this series. And I haven't opened them. I haven't done anything with them. So we're going to try them out together. And I've got my swatch sheet already done. So I'll open them in the order that I've got them swatched. So the first one is... Um, let's zoom in. So Genuine Vermilion. Um, vermilion is made from one of the mercury minerals. And I might put a picture of that inset because I have a specimen in my private collection. These half pounds have got a label on them that is adhesive. And it has got an actual swatch, I believe, from this actual batch. And once you take that off, they've got glassine paper to protect them. So let's zoom back out again. So the adhesive doesn't actually stick to the paint. And the paint itself is in there i believe they make it in blocks and kind of die cut it and put it into the into the half pans and there's no information actually on the half pan so if you were to mix them up and not know um what that specimen was you could get into trouble so i'm just going to write just written on it so i know what it is and i'm going to pop it into my palette and they're a standard half pan and they fit the Schmincke palette really, really well. The next cab off the rank is Genuine Malachite. So that is a... Um, so Vermilion is Pigment Red 106, um, if you want to look up the pigment. It um, is opaque and pretty light fast. This is Malachite, which is Pigment Green 39, which is... Um, Copper carbonate hydroxide, aka basic copper carbonate. And I'm just going to take that off. And again, very similar. That looks like it was the edge of one of their sets because it's kind of bent down on one end. Um, I'm just getting the glassine off of the label because I want to stick these labels onto my swatch sheet because I want to keep them because they're cute. And I didn't try and get like primaries or anything when I got these. I just wanted to get some interesting colours. The next one is Carmine Lake, which is made with natural red 4 cochineal. So this is genuine crushed beetle from Mexico. It's transparent and it's a really nice cool red. So we've got a warm and a cool red. Uh, as I thought that would be an interesting thing to start us off. And obviously we've got a very interesting um, sort of bluish green there. The way they're constructed and sort of put together is really nice, and I really need to write on that one. I'm not going to bother writing on the malachite, because nothing is going to be quite the same as that colour. And the point of this series is to use older pigments. So they're not necessarily light, fast and beautiful and fantastic. They're intended to be early pigments. So now we have Lapis Lazuli Genuine, which is PB29. PB29 can be synthetic or natural. This is natural. So this is the mineral lapis lazuli. And again, I will probably insert some of my jewellery as I wear lapis lazuli pretty frequently. It's a, a favourite of mine, actually. 
It's if you've not seen it, it's a sort of ultramarine blue with little tiny crystals and pyrites. It has gold sparkly bits, and that makes it kind of special. Okay, so there's that, and I think that is really pretty. I'll just label it and then I'll show it to you. This series don't have um, numbers, so you know it's not like they're like two o one lapis lazuli. Like that's not there. They describe this as being semi-transparent, so I shall be interested in that. And then I decided to get two kind of oddball colours, and rather than getting yellow ochre, they they have lots and lots and lots of pigments, especially in their acrylic range, that are just muds and stones gathered from all over the United Kingdom ground down with very specialist techniques and made into paints and they are really beautiful. So rather than getting standard yellow ochre I got this one which is called Oxford ochre and it's just a mud that they obtain from um, somewhere in Oxfordshire and it's semi-transparent, it's obviously iron bearing and I'm wondering what it would be like to use it. I haven't used this even in acrylic, uh, it's not a colour I've gone for. They do have a yellow ochre in this series but me being me, I thought I'll go with the oddball one because it sounds kind of cool. And it's very, it looks like a block of mud there. So I'll have to label that one quite carefully because um, it's the sort of thing where you're just not going to remember what it is. Okay, that's it labelled. And that one has to go in on the end because I've gone out of series. And the last one is Oxford Mudstone, which they think is a substitute for Davies Grey, which is that very pale milky grey made with slate that we often use. And this is, again, a natural earth that they have pulled out of the ground uh, somewhere in the United Kingdom. And if people are interested, I will put more detail anywhere. Well, I'll put more detail anyway over on my website so that it will kind of complement this video. And I'll just mention to you all that I have now got a separate Twitter account for that kind of goes with this account. So if you want to follow me on Twitter, it is at the... No, hang on. It's at spin underscore doctor underscore art. So please pause the video, go follow me on Twitter and come back. Because um, I'm using that as a way to tell you when things are coming up and you'll see pictures of what videos are coming up. You'll get teasers. So... Um, that could be quite cool. And it also kind of enriches what I provide. So it's a way to show a little bit more. So what I ended up with is a warm red, kind of cool green, a cool red, a warm blue, and a kind of not quite, but a warm and a cool earth, or a warmer and a cooler earth. So I've set up a swatch sheet, as I always do, and if you want to just have a look at how I set these up. So I've got my Malachite Genuine, I've put my transparency in there already, and I've written in the mineral that they're made of. So I've given myself lots of space that I can draw. And I'll just get rid of the glassine paper, because we don't want that. And I'm going to stick in um, these. And because they're on adhesive paper, some of them will probably just stick... I hope. I might need to go in and do a little bit of messing and I'll put a little bit of um, pro marker onto here so that we can have a look at transparency and we'll see if they really are as they say they are and we'll see if these hold up. Now I'm not expecting them to be amazing because they are an early watercolour. They are really intended to show us what was used. They're not kind of going to be exactly, I mean, I've used some of this series before actually in, in the um, Turner series that they do they are not going to be like modern watercolors but they're also not going to be like ancient ones and the point of this series if I remember correctly and it's going back a few years since the rep told me about them that um, the kind of point of this series was to give the pigments and everything of the early watercolors but a base that's a little bit more like what we're used to. But I do know that they are a bugger to get them to get out of the pans because it's just their their nature is that they are a little bit harder to get out of the pans. They were not terribly expensive. Um, the most expensive, I think, was somewhere around £15, which you would pay for certain colours from our sort of standard manufacturers. 
the cheaper ones were around five pounds for a half pound, which is I always drop something in every bloody video, don't I? I'm so clumsy. Do excuse me, I'm going to pick that up. Ah, didn't roll far. That was my Tombow XS glue stick, which is really useful, really strong, and being tinted makes it rather easy to see. Ooh, head rush. That was fun. I like it when that happens. So, and I'll show you in a moment what's in those boxes so you can see what's coming up. They're not Daniel Smith, they're actually Windsor and Newton, and they were from... Ooh, it could be Jackson's delivered those today, I think. So, let's have a look at these, and I will do some Pro Marker, as I always do, because we need a black to, uh, to compare with. I'll put it underneath the labels, and then we'll do a swatch kind of here, kind of here. It helps if we've got focus. I'll do a swatch here, and then I'll do a transparency swatch over the black. Now, I know these are not easy to lift, but I have my insistence that when I'm doing these um, swatch videos that I am using the same squirrel brush for all of them because it adds an element of fairness when I'm comparing products. So we'll do the vermilion first, and I'm wetting it with my brush, and actually I think that's lifting really easily. Yeah. It doesn't have the hugest pigment load in the whole world, but that's because it doesn't lift terribly easily. It is opaque, as they say, and I'll bring these all up to the camera. Now, one has to be careful with the vermilion because it is a mercury compound, so I'm using separate paint water for washing my brush after that one because I don't want to spread that one around. The thing with mercury salts is they are volatile, and once dissolved in water, they can actually end up in the air very easily, and I don't really want to breathe. I use mercury day to day at work. I use all sorts of versions of mercury. Okay, the malachite is very hard to lift. There are genuine malachites out there that are so vivid and so strong. This is not one of them. This is a very, very pale malachite. I think the pigment load is high, but I think it's been ground very, very finely. And the finer you grind, um, almost the more grey these things become. But also a bugger to lift. I'm going to try it actually with another brush. Because I don't want to ruin that one. So I'll move to a synthetic and because these are an early, they do not have all the sort of extras that our modern watercolours have in them. Remember, our modern watercolours will have all sorts of wetting agents and clever things. These are not going to, because they are an early mimic watercolour. OK, that is lifting a lot more, but it's still struggling. The malachite is very hard to lift. Yeah, that is really getting hard, actually. OK. Actually, it's lifting a little bit. Sorry, you can't see that, can you? It's not terribly difficult, actually, once you get it really going. I'm going to put some on there, and then what I'll do is I will clean the brush. I'm just going to apply water to it, and I'm going to just leave that. We'll let it soak, and we'll see if... After it's soaked, we can get anything out of it. And we'll just find out. So now we're on to Carmine Lake. Carmine Lake looks to be wetting perhaps a bit more easily. No, perhaps not. I think these may need a little soak. But again... I don't want to completely knacker my brush. And I'm going by the swatch on the label that shows me I should be able to get more out than this. It is a transparent colour. So we can't expect miracles, but I'll go back to my trusty Daylon brush and work a little bit more. I'm slightly doing it off camera because it's not very exciting to see. And also jiggling the brush up and down. It will try and auto-focus. Oh, there we go. A little bit more. 
It's a little bit granular actually, it's quite interesting, but it is indeed transparent. And you'll get a chance at a proper look, obviously. Anon. And we'll try the uh, lapis lazuli, which again I'm thinking will probably be quite hard to lift, so I've gone straight to the um, Daylon brush. That's pretty. That is like a very, very pale, this is, I mean, it is a semi transparent colour. It's a very pale ultramarine, um, but pretty. And I think if you wetted this far enough in advance, you'd probably get a lot more than that out of it. But when I compare it to things like the Schmincke semi transparent ultramarine, it's very pale. I'm just going back to the Malachite a moment just to see. Oh yeah, actually quite a bit has lifted now. The malachite's behaving itself. I think these just need a soak. I think if you if you wet these in advance, you might have better um, luck with it. Shall I tell you what we'll do? I've just wetted those last two. But they're earth colours. They are going to be harder. I've wetted them. And what I'll do is, while they have a little moment to soak, I'll show you what I've just had delivered. And then you can see it. So... These are just a random selection of Windsor and Newton colours that were very cheap. So there's Chromium Black, which is from the limited edition Twilight set. Um, there'll be that in a video very soon. And Cobalt Green Deep, which is also from that set. Um, I didn't have the whole Twilight set, so there's three colours in this order that complete that series. And you'll see why, because I'm... Well, I've noticed something, and I want to see if I'm right. So uh, we'll see, and yeah, Dumont's Blue, Smalt, um, which is actually just uh, Ultramarine Violet um, in this case. Not very exciting. I got a Terra Velta Yellow Shade because I was running very low on that. And Brown Ochre um, I didn't have. Magnesium Brown I think I got, but this was like a pound, so you know. Cobalt Blue Deep, because I didn't have that. And Dark Brown, which is from the Desert set, which is long gone. Um, discontinued a long time ago. And um, so that's what they are. I will be doing a video that does the Twilight set, the bits of the Desert set that I've got. And then I'm going to go through loads of browns, because... Browns are a bit difficult. A lot of people hate tube browns, much like they hate tube greens, because they have a reputation for being unnatural looking or too opaque or very flat. So I wanted to show some that I really like, and if you mix them together with each other, you can get interesting effects. So I think they've had a little while now. I'm going to just try uh, encouraging the Oxford mudstone. I'm thinking of them as sort of like mud. You know, you need to let mud soak if you want to lift it for any reason. Like when you're a child and you play with it. Okay. This is a supposedly semi-transparent. And again, I think a bit more time. And perhaps a little bit of working with a synthetic brush. Or even, an, even a hog bristle. Might lift that very well. And then this Oxford ochre which seems to, oh yeah, that's picking up, and that's, as, again, it's advertised as semi-transparent, it's very, very, very weak. I don't think the camera's going to pick this up, but actually, it's not that weak, it's just a very, very light colour, and this paper is slightly off-white, and they kind of interfere with one another, but it is semi-transparent and beautifully granular, so... We'll just go through these colours in a second, and I'm just going to try and take a little bit more malachite and pop it on, because I think that that, yeah. Malachite's granulated like crazy, but that's because it's been dried and had another layer put on, and then been dried and had another layer put on, so it's almost kind of unfair. We've treated it very badly. So I'll bring up the paints first of all so that you can just see them. Um... So you can see they're very, very different, very, very dry. They don't look at all like the sort of modern watercolours. Um, much harder, much more clay-like, which is absolutely to be expected. These are an early watercolour. They are not designed to be like the super wettables, like the, the Mission Gold or whatever. Um, they are intended to be 
difficult because they're meant to be mimicking older materials. So one of the things I want to do with these is kind of learn to master them as a challenge to myself. Uh, I don't intend to have a huge set of them. They're really kind of a novelty. So let's have a look through them. Let's have a look at the original vermilion there. It's got a very light granulation to it. Um, it shows better off camera because it's an orangey red and cameras never pick up orange very well. But it's very pretty. Um, malachite has granulated, but again, I think it's an unfair granulation. It is, I mean, it's a granulated in colour, but I think that's gone a bit mad. The genuine carmine is granulating. It's a beautiful pink. It's very, very pale. Lapis lazuli slightly grey ultramarine and very granular but kind of like micro granulation it's really pretty it's got a nice sort of purple tint to it the mudstone you can actually you can see it really well on the camera probably better than you can in real life um it is what it is it's a semi-transparent color it looks like mud it is very similar to davies gray just as they say and then the oxford ochre which again actually the camera's picking up a lot better than i expected granulating pale yellow and again I want to play with those I want to see what they do and how they mix and of the colors that we've got I wanted to find out originally my plan was to find out you know, oops sorry I forgot to refocus you uh, one of my plans was to see if could I get these two to give me a neutral could I get these two to give me a neutral what happens when I mix these two do I get a good purple what happens but given they haven't wetted terribly well, I don't know quite how successful that's going to be. But let's give it a shot. So I'm going to put some... Yeah, this is going to be a really tricky one, but let's try it. Well, we're going to have to do it with what material we have, which is a small amount of ultramarine and or lapis lazuli and a small amount of cochineal. I'll pop it on a little scrap of paper. That's very insipid. They almost make each other worse. So that purple patch there that's very wet is the best I can get because they just don't want to come off their pans. I think this is going to be a spray them and leave them 20 minutes job, and then they probably need some ox gall as well when they're actually being used. But when I do my part two, my sort of other review that I'll do in a week or two when I've had a chance to play with these, that's going to pick that up, and we'll find out, well, what are they like in practice? What are they like when we actually try to use them? But I like, I like the colour of the vermilion. It's a really, really pretty colour. And that was actually the main red, and orpiment, which is an arsenic compound, was the main yellow until the 1800s when the cadmium red and the cadmium yellow kind of took over because um, they were man-made and they, and they kind of took over the supply. Similarly, malachite was a very, very popular colour until actually relatively recently. Um, it's not used quite so much anymore. Colours like Windsor Emerald are probably as near as we get to it, and that was discontinued in the 70s due to toxicity issues. Um, lapis lazuli we still have as French ultramarine which is the synthetic version of it but you can still get genuine lapis lazuli from all sorts of dealers like Daniel Smith and so on the muddy colours these are they're unique to this company you could not get anything like those anywhere else so I'm not even going to compare them and carmine, natural carmines you can get from other manufacturers should you wish them so what I will say is that these are obviously kind of slightly novelty paints because they are ultra high end early colours for people who want to experience what life was like 200 years ago. And I, I do, I, I genuinely am interested in how these are going to behave and what they're going to do, and kind of mastering them and learning to work with what they can and can't do, just as we do when we buy a paint today. We learn what, what can and can't it do, and we work from there. In terms of buying them, if anyone is interested, um, Pip Seymour, or Wallace Seymour as they now are called, have dealers around the world, whether they stock the watercolours and whether they stock the early watercolours is another story. I cannot find a single dealer in the United States, but in the post that's on my website that kind of relates to this, so that's www.the-spin-doctor.co.uk, if you go over there, 
you'll find a post that relates to this. It may even be linked in the video description just down there, or it might even be up in the iCards just up there. And you can have a look at that post, and that will give you information on who the dealers are and where they're based. I have no affiliation to any of them. I have no connection to any of them. This is a brand that does not sell via Amazon. Uh, you can't get it through sort of mainstream supply. But I think if people are interested in them, they might want to know about them. Now, I will be reviewing in these blank spaces their artist watercolours when they arrive, which are a very different kettle of fish. They are, again, slightly unique. Rather than just using gum Arabic, they use what some people would call Senegal gum Arabic or gum Senegal, which is from a different tree but very similar kind of product, mixed with honey, and that's how they make their artist ones. So I'm expecting those to re-wet beautifully. And then they have their ancient series, their 1800 series, which are made of gum tragicanth and the Senegal gum Arabic and honey. So they're going to be different again, but these are much more clay-like and really hard but I'm going to leave them to soak and see how I get on with them. If you're also interested, Pip Seymour did do a few books on watercolour, and I will link anything like that in the video description down there. I will also link the Schminke 12-pan empty palette, if you're interested in that, the brushes that I've used, and the paper, just in case anyone's interested, is ultra-cheap, hot press, Aquafine, really, really cheap paper, because you don't need good paper for colour swatches. Just use crap. It's a good way to use up papers that you didn't get on with. And I hate hot press. It's great for swatching though. Because you can stick things on hot press much more easily than you can on other presses. So that's my kind of take on them. Thank you very much and good evening.